You gonna tell me where you're taking me? Hello? I mean, it, it's a common courtesy. Common courtesy to tell somebody where it is that you're taking them. I, I, don't, I don't think that's so hard to ask, do you? Oh. You know, for a second, I thought you were this other guy. Mayfeld? Hey, Ando. Long time. So what, you came here to kill me? All you need to know is I've been a lot of rules to bring you along. Why am I so lucky? Because you're Imperial. Hey, that was a long time ago, all right? But you still know your Imperial clearances and protocols, don't you? Bucketheads, Mavar Tigar. Welcome to the 22nd action packed episode of Mando Vision. Nargai Tom, and thank you so much for once again checking out and supporting this small independent Star Wars podcast. We aren't here without you wonderful, wonderful people who are taking the time to download and listen to us during this wonderful second season of The Mandalorian. Today we are here to talk about Chapter 15, The Believer, written and directed by Rick. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to, ooh, I've been practicing all day and I'm going to botch it right now. Rick Famuiwa. I blew it. <laughs> Rick, I'm so sorry. I cannot get your name right for the life of me, but Rick Famuiwa, you are the best. You may recognize that name. He directed episodes two and six of season one of The Mandalorian. So he's back and this time he's getting a writing credit for his work on The Mandalorian, which is pretty darn exciting. And also to note, the first episode of the season not written by John Favreau or Dave Filoni. All right, before we dive into everything, remember, the best way to reach out to this Star Wars podcast is via social media. We are at Mando underscore Vision on Twitter and Instagram. Please be sure to like, subscribe, and share the show with all the other Mandos in your covert. And if possible, or so inclined, please give those sweet five-star reviews if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Remember, we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and a couple more. And if there's one you want us to be on that we're not there yet, please let me know, and I will make sure to get us on that platform as soon as possible. Uh, also, one more thing. We are part, we are a proud part of the 3 Bzine network of podcasts, so if you get a chance to please check out our parent website, 3 bzinecom you can find a link to all the shows that are part of the 3 Bzine network, such as Beer Night in San Diego, the TomCast podcast, and this fine podcast that you're listening to right now, MandoVision. There's also a link to our store envy page, so if you want some sweet, sweet merch to help support the podcasts, you can do that. And hey, they make for a great Christmas present, if I do say so myself. Remember, Sonic Charges are out of stock. Now, it's time to strap on your buckets, and let's break down Chapter 15, The Believer. Not going to need long inside, so once I get the coordinates, you guys got to get me the hell out of there. You get to the roof. I'll drop in and pull you out. All right. Mayfield and I will swap out for the drivers in the tunnel. Hey, as much as I'd like to take a road trip with Rebel Dropper here, that's not going to work. Oh, uh, yeah? Why is that? Well, because these remnant bases are set up and run by XISB. If you get scanned and your genetic signature shows up on any new Republic register, you're going to be detected, and it's guns out. You sure do know a lot about Imperial remnants. Hey, if you want to accuse me of something, then just say it. We don't have time for this. Fennec will go. No, I'm wanted by the ISB. I'll trip the alarm, too. Fet. Let's just say they might recognize my face. Great, so it's me going in alone. No way. The minute he gets inside, he'll tip him off. He'll be a hero. Hey, I'm, this wasn't my idea. I'm doing you guys a favor. Deal's off. I'm taking him back. I'll go. Hey, buddy, I might be good at fast talking, but I don't think I can explain away a guy in a Mando suit to Imperial guards. So unless you're gonna take off that helmet, it's gonna be me going in alone. Or say goodbye to your little green friend. You're not going alone. I'm coming with you. But I won't be showing my face. Hey, all right, so there you go. More audio clips. We're playing the audio clips like crazy right now. 
And we're moving the episode along quite quickly, but let's kind of back it up for a minute. You know, there's a lot to kind of get into with this episode. I think it's a really good episode. I think it's a really strong episode. Um, and that that just sort of continues the trend, I think, for this season, where uh, I, I don't feel like there have been a ton of those uh, filler episodes that I kind of complained about in season one. Now, this has been, uh, you know, pretty, pretty forward forward momentum on, on the majority of these, of these episodes. Has it been a little uh, side questy? Has it been a little, uh, you know, RPG in, in that sense? You gotta, you know, do a thing to get a thing. Ah, right, sure, a little bit. That can, that can be a that's a reasonable argument to make against this season of The Mandalorian so far. Uh, but I've I've enjoyed the the vast majority of what we've gotten so far in this season. I, I want to kind of explore uh, the title of this episode, The Believer, uh, because. Uh, I, 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 my my main assertion is that that refers to Din Djarin. He is the believer. He he believes in the way. He follows the way. And this episode tests those those beliefs uh, to to the limit, and and uh, forces him to confront what he what he values the most that that belief in the way or Grogu in in rescuing his his adopted child from the clutches of Moff Gideon. Uh, but there's also a little bit more. I think there's more complexity to to that title alone because we encounter other uh, people of belief in this episode, and uh, I, I will refer to the the returning Ben Burr as Miggs Mayfeld, the uh, former Imperial sharpshooter who uh, we opened this episode w- with in a New Republic prison camp, salvaging Tie Fighters. Really great visual effect on there. I love, love the way that looked. That was I thought that was a really killer opening, just to see this junkyard full of Tie Fighters. Uh, but in relation to the title, I, I feel like you can you can look at Migs as sort of the uh, the former believer, you know, who's who lost that belief, and we'll t- we'll talk about a little bit more about that as the episode kind of progresses because you know w- when Mayfeld was first introduced in season one, he was kind of a shallow one note character, former Imperial turned criminal. Yeah, okay, we kind of get that. But now we sort of get, well, not even sort of, I mean, we get Mayfeld's backstory. We we learn what disillusioned him with the Empire. Now, was he a true believer from the beginning? Uh, maybe, maybe not. He might have just been a man making his way through the galaxy, you know, much like a lot of the other, other characters are. And he chose to become an Imperial because that was a good way to put his, his skill set to use, perhaps. Again, but he must have had some belief in the Empire at the time, and then that was obviously rattled to the core by the events that we will talk about uh, in in that in that wonderful scene in the in the officers' mess at at the base. But we'll we'll talk about that again. We will talk about that later. And then the other character who we should definitely talk about as as a as a as a true believer again, the other side of the coin, is that Imperial officer that they are with in the mess. Uh, Valen Hess is his name. And he is, um, uh, I, I, I kind of want to say fanatical in, in his sort of belief in the rightness of what the Empire does, no matter how many people are killed or sacrificed in the name of order and Imperial control across the galaxy. So they're, they're sort of, again, I do not want to, to say that this episode, the title does not refer to Din Djarin because I believe 100% that it does. But it sort of takes everyone... There's sort of a collision of believers here. And I think that's one of the things I liked about this episode. Because uh, you, you get to... This episode gets to get, gets to have a, a, a bit of a conversation about the different philosophies and the politics of Star Wars, which is something that we don't get into very often. You know, the... Again, we're not quite there yet, but the scene where 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 Din and, and Mayfeld are driving the transport and they're going through that small village... And and Migs makes the comment like New Republic Empire. It doesn't matter these people; they're all just invaders. Uh, it, it's it's an interesting interesting notion. Again, there's a lot of uh, really interesting things that happen in this episode. A lot of interesting conversations, and it allows us to get to get another view of Star Wars in a way that maybe we don't think about sometimes. And again, we'll talk about that because there's some kind of complicated things going on in this episode, uh, particularly as we get to like the big action set pieces, thing, the big transport scene. And um, but Sam, excuse me, the the transport scene chase, and then obviously the big shootout and, and and all that stuff. I mean, these are wonderful set action set pieces, 
and, and Rick directs the holy heck out of him, as he did in in chapter two and in chapter six. Remember, chapter two is the as the episode uh, where 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 Din has to get the the, uh, the the parts for the Razor Crest back from the Jawas. So there's a big battle on top of the Sandcrawler. Remember that? That was a great action piece, action set piece as well. And then obviously the battle with the Mudhorn. And then chapter six is, is the episode that introduces us to Mayfeld as they, they raid the Re- New Republic uh, prison ship. And again, more action, more great action set pieces, more uh, New Republic security droids, which I always enjoy seeing. And we open the episode with the Re- Republic security droid too. So a lot of fun stuff. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's where we start. There's a lot, a lot to get into. Uh, this episode, the first episode uh, with no Grogu at all, nothing. I mean, even even the first episode, we get to see him for a, you know a glimpse that glimpse him at the very end of that first chapter, but this is the first one where he's not in it at all. To my at least in my recollection, please correct me if I'm wrong. But we get more Fennec, we get more Boba, Bill Burr's back as Mayfeld. Some people may have a problem with that. I I'm not one of them. I'm okay with that. So so bring it on. And again, we open up at a New Republic prison, planet, complex, scrapyard thing, and it's just it's just walls of TIE fighters, cockpits built up, and you see different prisoners, different species, uh, just, uh, you know, basically scrapping them, you know, reducing them to scrap, maybe taking any components that might be of use uh, to the New Republic, and that whole situation. We also get to see more of those those really cool-looking, like, ad style cranes. I, you know, we saw that earlier uh, when one of them picked up the Razor Crest out of the water. I think it was chapter... Oh, gosh, I'm already forgetting. Was it 10 or 11? I don't know when they get to the when they get to the water plant, the one with Bo Katan that episode, and uh, well, you know we find out that Cara Dune. Now again, from the implication in last episode, it seemed like they were going to jailbreak Mayfield out out of New Republic custody, but uh, Cara Dune's new position as as a New Republic marshal uh, permits her certain privileges, and she's able to get uh, Mayfield released under her uh, supervision, basically, because they're going to use him for a mission. So apparently that falls within the New Republic's parameters, so they're able to uh, remand Mayfeld into her custody. But she's not telling him much, and they make their way back. Uh, oh, well, make their way back. They start heading away to Kara's ship, which we find that we see in the distance, and it's Slave One, and it's wonderful, and it's glorious, because Slave One is a great ship. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but I love that ship. If I didn't talk to you about that last week, oh boy, I am such a fan of Slave One and that cool look that it has and the way it flies, the way it maneuvers, the distinctive engine sounds it makes. I love Slave One. That is a great starship. But they kind of come over the, over the dune there. As we see Slave One, we also see Fennec Shand and Boba Fett polished up that armor. Gave it a new paint job, and he's looking real good, real good. You know, from the from the sound clip that we played at the opening of the episode, you know, we 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 put it right out there on Front Street. Why Mando needs Mayfeld? Uh, as a former Imperial, he knows the codes, he knows the procedures, the protocols. So Miggs is going to be their way in when it comes to finding Moff Gideon's ship and and re- the enabling them to rescue Grogu. Which is which is what we've been building towards here for these 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 final two episodes of, of the sh- of the season, so they need Mayfield for that. Now, as they are leaving that that prison planet, that that uh, and they're aboard Slave One. Listen, I was really excited about this because it's something that we hadn't seen just yet, but I was really excited that we were able to get a glimpse of sort of like the inner hold area of Slave One, something we hadn't seen before, and I love the way that as they're talking. You're seeing the ship as it sort of rotates and that decking they're on staying level and flat the entire time as the ship rotates around them. And I, I just, it's like a, this crazy gyroscope and I just loved it so much. It was so fascinating to see, again, those those inner workings. You know, in the films, we've only rarely ever gotten glimpses of Slave One via the cockpit. I mean, which is nice and impressive, but... As I said before, part of the the aesthetic charm of that ship is the way it maneuvers, the way it flies. You know, it it flies almost in an upright vertical position, but when you see it uh, landed, it's it's on its backside basically. You know, upright, and, and you get into the cockpit, and you're basically laying down. Uh, so it's, it, I was really excited to kind of see the the inner workings 
of Slave One for the first time, and I thought they did a really wonderful job of of of, of making it uh, make sense. You know, again, sort of this, this crazy gyroscopic situation where the ship rotates around the deck so that the the whoever's in the cargo hold, you know, whatever people are on board, uh, aren't getting tossed around while the ship maneuvers. Uh, I thought it was pretty darn neat. Uh, this is also the point where Mayfield tells them that he can't just, you know, access any, you know, bit of, of data, you know, Imperial networks or whatever to, to, to get the information they need. They need to go to a specific uh, sort of uh, internal Imperial terminal. And apparently the nearest one is on the planet Morak, which is a secret Imperial mining hub. Now, something else also happens in this, in this opening sequence here. Um, and that's Boba Fett without a helmet. You saw it. You all saw it. It's Boba Fett without a helmet. Now, this is an interesting uh, sort of development. I, again, I'm going to reference uh, the old Star Wars legends, the old canon that no longer counts. Uh, but in that old canon, it was very much assumed and something that you know, many, many writers uh, uh, leaned into and played up was the fact that Boba Fett didn't remove his helmet. They never gave the specifics of why. It all just sort of led to the the, the, bu the building of the mystery of who was the man under the mask. You know, because, uh, again, a lot of that stuff, a lot of that old canon predates episode two when we would realize that, uh, uh, who we would re realize who was under the, uh, underneath that mask. So they really played up that masked man identity of Boba Fett in the old canon, and and and, uh, and again by by not having him be someone who voluntarily removes his helmet very frequently, especially not in the company of others, and and so it's it's sort of interesting to see how that aspect of Boba Fett's old canon has sort of been incorporated in the new canon for this uh, this 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 uh, group of zealots, as Bo Katan called them, uh, the Children of the Watch, who. Again, do they, as we as we were state as we, as we've learned, they do not remove their helmets in front of others. They do not remove their helmets for no, for no need. They do not have their helmets removed by others, uh, at at the risk of not being a true Mandalore anymore. Uh, so an, an interesting dichotomy, an interesting development in the legacy of of Boba Fett and how he's sort of changed in this new canon, and how he sort of uh, is a man who does what he will. Now, granted, he spends the majority of this episode armored up and helmeted up, but you do get that shot of him inside Slave One with no helmet on. And and, and it's it's something to contrast against Din Djarin, especially as this episode plays out. And Din has to make uh, a very big decision later in this episode. Uh, so I think, it, I think, again, I think it contrasts nicely to to what we've seen with Boba Fett so far. Again, you know, Boba, Din's not hanging out with a lot of, of Mandalorians in, in per se. I mean, coming against Bo-Katan Kreez was uh, something of a shock to him. Mandalorians who removed their helmet. And then uh, uh, Boba Fett may have Mandalorian armor, but he does not ascribe to any creed of the Mandalorians. And so Din is very much uh, surrounded by people who are like him, but very different from him in the beliefs that he has had instilled in him. And again, this plays out later on in the episode in a, in a big, big, bad way. And it's, you know, really important stuff. All right, so we're on Morak. And we find out that the, the Empire's there and they're mining Rhydonium, which is the name of, of a fuel substance, a fuel component, fuel source, if you will, that we've heard mentioned many times in Star Wars The Clone Wars, in Star Wars Rebels. It's been in there. It's highly volatile. We see a lot of explosive things happening. and But it's important. You need it to, to do things, to make things go boom a lot, or to power starships. No coaxium in this movie, in this episode, by the way. It's, it'll be interesting to see how much uh, coaxium is embraced in the larger Star Wars lore down the road, or if that's just going to be kind of like an anomaly for uh, the solo film, which was... I think the first time I ever heard the term, I don't know. What do you? What do you? What's y'all? What are? What is you all's recollection of you all's? By the way, really great grammar so far in this podcast. Uh, but I'm curious what you all uh, remember of coaxium, if anything at all. You know, has it been used other places? I don't think so. I sure don't think so. 
Uh, anyways, so we have to form a plan. And that plan gets complicated by the fact, from the sound clip we just played prior, that uh, uh, facial recognition is a bit of a big deal for the internal, uh, for the the Imperial Internal Security Bureau. I'm sorry, the Imperial Security Bureau, the ISB, who is running this facility, this remnant facility, as it's called. They actually use the term remnant, which I was really stoked about, too, uh, because I've referred to them as the Imperial Remnant in the past because it, it's a, it's terminology from old canon, old lore. Uh, but I feel like it may be the first time in the new Disney canon that it's been referred to as the Imperial Remnant. So, again, exciting developments, exciting things happening across the boards here in this episode. Uh, and, and just kind of like the subtle uh, incorporation of, of, of old things into the new things. Uh, and I love it so much. So so Migs tells us about what's going on, why uh, why Mayfeld can't go in there by himself. But, you know, Cara Dune, Fennec Shand, Boba Fett, all known to the Imperial Security Bureau. So any facial recognition on them is going to trigger alarms and alerts and get gu guns drawn and cause all kinds of crazy chaos. So the decision's made that Din Djarin will have to go in with Migs because they're not going to send Migs in alone. They don't trust him. They think he could easily rat them out. Uh, and that's partially because like we don't know his backstory yet. We don't know why he left the Empire. We don't know the circumstances or the situation in which it was. They just view him, Cardoon in particular, views him as an Imperial to this day, like to the core. So... Again, there's no trust there. There's no belief that he's gonna he's gonna honor the the deal that they've struck, and and it, it puts them in a situation where Din will have to uh, put aside his Beskar plated Mandalorian armor and don the armor of of a a, a, a transport trooper, you know, running the Rhydonium back to the Imperial facility where it would be refined. So Din swaps out his armor for the stormtrooper armor. Or not stormtrooper, you know the that transporter, it's transporter. Jeez, Louise, that imperial tr uh, transport trooper armor, and then they they make their way to the refinery. They have their truckload of the Rhydonium, and as they're they're going about their on their merry way, uh, you see the the bombed out wreckage of of other transports that have that have exploded along the way, and I think I think we're supposed to make the assumption that. You know the Rodonium is so volatile that these ships, these these cruisers, have all exploded. But there's so many of them in such a close proximity that I think we all we have to have kind of our, our red alert flags up. I guess I know red alert is not something we say in Star Wars, but the red flags go up, and 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 you have to start paying attention to what's going on here. Now, as they roll through the village, we start to get a, a little bit into that that uh, that uh, unique sort of Star Wars philosophical uh, political discussion. That is, is again, rather unique to, to Star Wars sometimes. You know, we, we get wrapped up in the big action, the big adventures. And it's, it's, um, it's easy to forget, you know, this is, that uh, there are people who live in this galaxy who are not the heroes all the time and who aren't making the sacrifice uh, to be a rebel or, or to be on the side of the Empire. They're just trying to live their lives. And that is one of the ne neater aspects of The Mandalorian is sort of, it's it's weird to say ground level approach uh, to Star Wars, but uh, you have a more of a, a man on the street sort of vibe here, uh, particularly as as Din is gazing out the window at the people of this town and how the, they've sort of been oppressed by the Empire, and it leads to an interesting conversation, or not? It's not even a conversation. It's just some interesting uh, uh, truth time with with uh, with Migs Mayfeld, and I'm gonna go ahead and play that for you right now. And then it's a little bit of a long scene, but I'm gonna let it run as best I can and try not to talk over it too much. Here we go. Yeah, Empire, New Republic. It's all the same to these people. Invaders on their land is all we are. I'm just saying, somewhere, someone in this galaxy is ruling and others are being ruled. I mean, look at your race. Do you really think all those people that died in wars fought by Mandalorians actually had a choice? So how are they any different than the Empire? Look, if you were born on Mandalore, you believe one thing. If you are born on Alderaan, you believe something else. But guess what? Neither one of them exists anymore. Hey, I'm just a realist. I'm a survivor, just like you. Let's get one thing straight. You and I are nothing alike. 
I don't know. Seems to me like your rules start to change when you get desperate. I mean, look at you. You said you couldn't take your helmet off, and now you got a stormtrooper one on. So what's the rule? Is it that you can't take off your Mando helmet, or you can't show your face? Because there is a difference. Look, I'm just saying. We're all the same. Everybody's got their lines they don't cross until things get messy. As far as I'm concerned, if you can make it through your day and still sleep at night, you're doing better than most. Control, this is Juggernaut 3. Hey, there you go. Pretty good stuff right there. I think it's an interesting... Again, an, an interesting uh, piece of dialogue from from Bill Burr slash Miggs Mayfeld as as he sort of is, is uh, trying to have a conversation with with, with Din Djarin, but uh, Din wants no part of it. Uh, you know, I, I think this season has done a lot as far as, as confronting Din with other truths about Mandalorians and who the Mandalorians are and uh, information about Mandalore itself. And, and he's, I think he has sort of quietly been questioning many of the things he thought he knew as, as truth. And, and this conversation is sort of hammering it home. So I don't think he has, he, he has no response because... Uh, Din, Din is kind of internalizing this argument for himself already. You know, his experiences with Bo-Katan and, and Ahsoka Tano. You know, again, he was told the Jedi are the enemy, and he made a very powerful ally out of Ahsoka Tano. Um, he made a powerful ally with, uh, with, with Bo-Katan Kryze as someone who he initially viewed as not a true Mandalorian. And I think who proved themselves to be true Mandalorians, despite the fact that they removed their helmets in spite the fact that they conduct themselves very differently than than uh, the Mandalorians he has been around, been raised by, again, this Children of the Watch, and don't think we're not going to talk about Children of the Watch during the during uh, during the episodes in between seasons two and three, because we cert most certainly certainly will. Uh, but again, it's 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 really interesting stuff. I really like the sort of internal struggle that Din seems to be going through, uh, and and it all coalesces. In this episode, as he makes a, a, a very big decision and a very significant decision later on, and uh, it, I again, I'm acting like you haven't seen this episode and I'm walking you through it, and I'm going to be the one who makes the big reveal. You all know what I'm talking about, so don't. <laughs> I'm not trying to play sound like I'm smarter than anybody else in the room here. We all watched the episode already, uh, but and you so you know exactly what I'm referring to. But for the sake of of uh, of uh, synchronicity and, and chron chron chronology. Let's just let's just pretend it hasn't happened yet, and we don't know about it. <laughs> All right, so this this leads to the big, the big attack on the transport, and Din calls these people pirates. Now this is a new species that we don't know much about. Uh, they're called the Shy Dope, Shy Dop, Shy Dop, S H Y D O P P is what they are, are have been named. Um, and there's not a lot of, of history about them at this point in the show. This is we do not know anything about them, but they are uh, listed. Or I'm sorry, again, Din calls them pirates, which is an interesting point of view. Or is it interesting to need to call them? I should say because listen, let's be honest. The actions of these care of these 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 aliens of, of this group of marauders and I, I use the word marauder just to kind of act as an adjective here for me um for pirates they don't do very piratey things you know uh, yeah i would i would think a pirate is there to steal the rhydonium so they can make the profit from it they can refine themselves and sell it for themselves in the black market that's not what they're doing they're attempting to blow up the Rhydonium, to blow up the Imperials, which makes me wonder if perhaps they are not pirates, but freedom fighters for this planet, for Morak. Um, and I th I, it, that's sort of the, the take I had on it watching this episode. And I've, I've not found any other articles or, or, or anything. Um, there may be some something on Twitter by now. There may be some other comments that I haven't come across just yet. I, I don't want to believe that I'm the first person to think of this or, or to come up with this idea, but I, 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 I have to entertain the notion because this is an episode that presents a lot of, a lot of contrasts and a lot of things to kind of analyze, especially based on, on, on assumptions 
and uh, you know the characters have to question many many things. I think it's fair to question Din's assertion that these are just pirates and marauders and they're there to uh, do harm. Now, yes, they are an obstacle that Din and Mayfield have to overcome to get to their objective so they can achieve what they have to achieve so they can get that information to rescue Grogu. But it's not as clear cut. It may not be as clear cut as all that in the long run, in the grand scheme of things. Again, these could be very easily be freedom fighters who are trying to, you know, end imperial oppression. They are blowing up transports. They're not. They're not robbing them. They're blowing them up. There's no profit to be made from that. Pirates want to profit. Um, so I have to question these things. It leads to a wonderful action set piece, like we talked about. Rick directed the hell out of that uh, that Jawa battle scene uh, in chapter two, and. Uh, my first reaction was I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is like this is like a Mad Max movie happening right here, uh, like a Star Wars version of Mad Max." But 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 friend of the show Ken Garten, who has joined me uh, on the Tomcast podcast to to discuss Iron Man and some other Marvel uh, uh, things, um, pointed out to me that the, this is actually reminiscent of a William Friedkin movie called a uh, Sorcerer about a group of of, of like, like tanker truck runners going through a dangerous uh, stretch where they are attacked by marauders and things like that. And uh, after looking it up, after Ken sent that to me, uh, I completely agree with his assertion because it, it sounds exactly like what we just saw on this episode of The Mandalorian. So check out that Friedkin, Friedkin film. The, it's, it's just called Sorcerer. Uh, and I think Roy Scheider's in it. Roy Scheider of Jaws is in this film. So it, I, I've already put it on my on my, my, my to-watch list. And... and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to check that out. But that's very... Again, if you read the plot, <laughs> that's exactly what we saw. And it, it's a great action piece, and it's really, really well done. And they, uh, Rick really does a really great job of rap, ratcheting up the tension as Mando is battling these these supposed pirates on the top of the, of the, of the Rhydonium transport truck. And... It just it's just great. They ratchet up the tension. The right you know you got remember you got the the rhydonium is very volatile, so it can't uh, be be you can't just drive like a crazy person or else it's going to explode and kill everybody anyways. So you get the great you get this great action sequence, and I'm not going to go through it beat by beat, but it's it's really really good. It's really really strong. It, it is almost the centerpiece of the entire episode because it is it is so wonderful to watch, especially the way Din engages with the, with those marauders. Um, and then again, uh, 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 something to kind of challenge our perspective on on things, and, and Mayfeld points this out as well. Uh, but when the Tie Fighters arrive on the scene to to blast those Marauders to to rescue the transport to rescue Din and Mayfeld uh, uh, from what seemed to be possible destruction, and 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 you you have this this scene where the transport arrives at the Imperial facility, and you you see stormtroopers cheering. And, and, and rooting on our heroes as they, they made this uh, journey through through this hostile territory. And it's, it's, it's wild. And again, something to kind of challenge our perceptions a little bit because that's something we, we don't get to see before. We've never really had that imperial perspective of, uh, in a film, in a, in a TV show, in anything outside of books, maybe some comic books. It's, it's really rare to get that imperial perspective on things and to see that... You know, maybe yeah, maybe they are the they are the bad guys, but like they're not these cold, uh, unfeeling people. You know, they 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 have they have a job to do. They're trying to do it. And again, I'm not trying to uh, defend the empire. They are space fascists. Let's be perfectly honest. But it was different to see sort of this uh, different emotional reaction from the empire, uh, particularly in the fact that they 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 just saved our 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 hero Dinjarin. <laughs> But then you watch them mow down these these again supposed pirates that I sort of still think are just freedom fighters, and it, it sort of that maybe maybe it's just that mentality that I had, um, but it, it adds a certain uh, uh, tragicness to the episode that kind of goes un, under is kind of understated under the radar under the surface if that turns out to be the case and and you know the way this episode ends maybe we'll find out more about it because. Uh, uh, Again, I'll just jump to the end here. Mayfield gets left on this planet. Maybe he's going to find out a lot more about these people. Maybe, maybe he's going to help them fight the Empire and get them off their planet. Maybe all of a sudden Miggs has a, a change of heart and goes from being a criminal to a freedom fighter himself. 
again, something else to talk about for another time. We should also mention at this point, too, uh, we, we, we get a sighting of the, the coastal stormtroopers that we, we saw back in Rogue One on Scarif. You know, that sort of tannish, uh, uh, you know, tropical camouflage-esque stormtrooper. And that was always a design I thought was really neat, so I was, I was happy to uh, to see that incorporated once again uh, uh, by Star Wars. You know, I always love... I'm, I'm a big fan of the look of, of so many of the Stormtrooper designs and the Stormtrooper armors. So it was always fun to see those back in play. And and, and again, I like those those ones for the Scarab Troopers. Now, granted, don't get me wrong, the visual in Rogue One of, of Stormtroopers wading through like the, this like crystal blue tropical water was like just completely evocative. But I like that sort of unique design of those Scarab Troopers. And, and you know, maybe, maybe it's just they just do it to, to make more toys and, and, and Funko Pops. But uh, I like having Stormtroopers in... in uh, uh, planet-appropriate armor, I guess, is the way I want to kind of term that. So really neat, really neat. So our our, her- our heroes, well, our hero, Din Djarin, and Mayfeld arrive. They're in the Imperial base. They're in that refinery now. They're still being cheered and applauded by 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 their, you know, quote-unquote fellow Imperials. And again, it's a weird scene to, to sort of see, uh, to see sort of this this Imperial elation at... at uh, at the successful arrival of this this tanker truck, and again, it, it sort of puts a human face to the empire, which is something we don't see very often. Um, and I, but I say that carefully because remember, they're still space fascists, and that's still not a good thing. So don't don't get it twisted. But it is it is a reminder that these are people that are being killed on on a regular basis, whether they're, they're right or wrong or not. I mean, they're still people. Um, and yes, it's fun to watch Stormtroopers get smashed in the mush by Boba Fett with gaffy sticks and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, it's still a person in there. And I, I think well, I wonder if that's sort of like the point with this episode is to kind of remind us of that. That yeah, maybe they're wrong, but they're, they're still people. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, though. I don't know. What do you think? Well, so now's the time. Uh, they're in the base. Uh, Mayfeld assumes that the, the, the terminal they need will be in the officer's mess. And sure enough, he's right. And so Din's going to wait outside and, and Mayfeld's going to go in there. As soon as Mayfeld steps inside of the mess, though, he recognizes the officer seated at one of the tables there. And it's it's uh, a, 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 a... Well, let's put it this way. It's an officer named Valen Hess. But I think we all know him better as Joe Chill, the killer of Thomas and Martha Wayne. That's right. The Joe Chill from the... Jonathan... Jonathan. The Chris Nolan directed Batman Begins. So if Batman's out there looking for Joe Chill, he's gonna have to go to Morak to find him and get get that get that sweet sweet revenge for his parents. Uh, but it, it it it's it's always kind of fun to see the, these uh, familiar faces uh, pop up in Star Wars now, and that's one of the things I think Mandalorian has done really a really nice job of. Uh, you know, it's not always a, a necessarily known name, but it's always a familiar face. And and you know yes okay I get it he also was the Night King on Game of Thrones fine if you want to go and be the Game of Thrones guy on the on the Star Wars podcast that's fine too I get it he was the Night King I get it but Mayfeld recognizes him that is an officer he served under Mayfeld freaks out and decides he can't go in there to 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 access the terminal the way he told uh, Din he was going to well this puts Din in a, in a, in, a, in a Din's like oh well, I'll go and do it. And then the the big revelation that, uh, well, that thing's going to scan your face, dude. So you can't go in there with your helmet on and, and, and access the information that you need because it is going to scan your face. And this is this is sort of the moment uh, where, where Din... Uh, and it, he, doesn't, he doesn't contemplate it for too long. Uh, he makes the decision quickly that Grogu is of the utmost importance to him. Rescuing him, reuniting with Grogu is all that matters. You know, this may be the way, but there is no way without Grogu at his side. It's just sort of the way I take that to, 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 to be his, his rationale. Like, I will do whatever it takes to get the child back. And if that means, you know, breaking my vow in order to do so, in order to honor the, the the promise I made to protect that child and deliver that child and keep that child safe. He does it. And and again, it's a... You contrast it back to season one where 
Din was much more uh, blindly following the way and, and much more uh, adherent to the creed of the Children of the Watch and how reluctant he was to have his helmet removed by by IG-11. And it was not until IG-11 convinces him is that, well, it doesn't count because I'm not a real life form. I'm, I am a synthetic. I am not a real person. And that was the only way, reason why Din survived the injuries he suffered at the end of season one in, in the in the finale of season one of the Mandalorian, and now he's to a point after a, a bonding with this child after after growing with Grogu, um, it, it, he 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 almost doesn't hesitate at all. I mean, there's this a quick pause, and he realizes that getting Grogu back is everything. That is the way for him. And, and so he makes the decision. He's going to go in there, and he's going to get that information. Now, he does try to get the information with his helmet on, and it, it goes about as well as we all expected. So we, this is, it's at this point that we get our Pedro Pascal sighting for the season. How about that? They're always finding new ways for, him to, to, for, for Pedro to pop up and, and let us know that, hey, I'm still on the show, damn it. I didn't get fired and replaced. I'm Pedro Pascal. Uh, and it's it's again, but it's it's a significant moment in the development of Din Djarin's character, as he puts Grogu ahead of the creed of the way of of everything he's sort of been taught about being what it means to be a Mandalorian, and this season gave him the trials and the tribulations to to I think help make that decision, and and as he's again as he's grown with the child as he's bonded more to Grogu as, as they become closer as, as this sort of a, a, a unique family unit, uh, the, the decision's obvious. There, there really isn't one for Din, and, and he knows that. And like I said, he, I think he makes that jet choice fairly quickly. Yes, he, he might pause. He might have tried to work around the computer. But maybe he's like, well, maybe it's not that good of a computer. And, but obviously it was. And now it's at this point that the officer, Valen Hess, takes notice of Din Djarin accessing this terminal and decides he wants to have a conversation with them. And this is when Neifeld steps up to, to make sure that uh, uh, Din doesn't get exposed on the spot because he has no idea what an Imperial Stormtrooper identification number is. He's a no TK-421 Why Aren't You At Your Post. He's never heard that. He didn't watch Star Wars. We did. We know TK-421 Why Aren't You At Your Post. Uh, so Mayfeld steps up. He gets involved. And... and Hess makes an he, he's an interesting fellow. I, I I'm not sure if I initially would have bought the the idea of of, of an imperial officer kind of cohorting with with uh, random enlisted stormtrooper men, uh, but perhaps because they are the heroes who brought their who were the only ones to bring their transport back, uh, he feels that they deserve some kind of special recognition or or whatnot. Uh, but this is where we get sort of our, 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 our revelations about Mayfeld's character and kind of where he's coming from. And, and again, it gives him a lot of depth and a lot, of, a lot more substance than we got from his initial appearance back in season one. And I, I, I think Bill Burr does a, does a mighty fine job with this. I mean, remember, Bill Burr is a comedian, and maybe you're a fan of his work and maybe you're not. Uh, you know... But uh, his acting chops not 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 too bad. I think he delivers this scene really really well. And I'm uh, you know as we do on the show, we are going to play it for you right now. So here we go. Let's listen to it. The uh, a fairly intense conversation, and we'll talk about some of the significance of what was said in here uh, at the at the end of it. Because I again I think this again yes the transport scene may be the centerpiece the center action piece, but as far as like dramatic tension goes, this is pretty darn good. Here we go. How about a toast to Operation Cinder? Now there's a man who knows his history. No, I don't just know it. I lived it. I was in Burning Khan. Burning Khan? Mm. That was a hard day. I had to make many unpleasant decisions. Yes, you did. Entire city gone in moments, along with everybody in it. We lost our whole division that day. Man, I was like five, ten thousand people. Yep. 
All heroes of the Empire. Yeah. And all dead. Well, it's a small sacrifice for the greater good, son. Depends on who you ask, don't you think? What you get in that trooper? All those people. The ones who died. Was it good for them? Hmm? Their families? The guys I served with? Civilians, those poor mud scuffers, died defending their homes, fighting for freedom. Was it good for them? But we've outlasted them, son. They're eating themselves alive. The new republic is in complete disarray, and we grow stronger. You see, with the Redonium you've delivered, we can create havoc that's going to make burning con just pale by comparison. And then they're going to turn to us once again. You see, boys, everybody thinks they want freedom. But what they really want is order. And when they realize that, they're going to welcome us back with open arms. the Empire. Boom. In the chest. Love it. Great stuff right there. And that begins the shootout, which triggers an escape. I love the next the, the next shot, which is an awkward stare of a stormtrooper with a cafeteria tray in his hands right before Miggs plugs him in the chest. Great stuff. Really, really good. Oh, watch that all day. I did neglect to mention uh, uh, the, the office space reference just prior to this scene where where uh, where Mayfeld tries to usher Din Djarin out of the room and by telling him that they have to go and finish their TPS reports. Uh, so, great Office Space reference. I'm sure everyone caught that one. Uh, I don't think that was a um, super subtle Easter egg, as I think we've all have seen Office Space at least 42,000 times uh, over the years. Uh, but this, the big significant part of, of that conversation was Operation Cinder itself. Now, maybe not everyone in, in, in the audience is, is a big video game fan, but Operation Cinder is basically the, the what you have to stop from happening in Star Wars Battlefront 2 on Xbox and PlayStation. Uh, a really fun video game. I have to admit, I have not completed it, but now I'm actually a lot more interested in going back to finish the game. Uh, but Operation Cinder was a... Um, <laughs> It was a contingency plan by Emperor Palpatine, uh, excuse me, by Emperor Palpatine that he called contingency. <laughs> a little weird and redundant, but okay. But yeah, Operation Cinder involved uh, involved uh, uh, the destroying of core Imperial worlds, you know, running them to the ground, making it so that if the Empire falls, if he were to fall, the Empire would go with him, and the, there would be nothing left for the new, new for the new Republic to. Uh, be able to take over basically there'd be no uh, th these core important worlds to the empire would not exist for the new republic and thus would make the new republic completely unstable and untenable and then they would move the empire that would be would move and rebuild these worlds in the unknown regions where uh, clones of Palpatine were secretly being developed which we saw in, in Rise of Skywalker that's the basic gist of the game uh, but it is it is a fun game I do need to go back and finish playing it I'm not going to lie uh, but I'm a lot more intrigued now that, uh, again, another video game, another Star Wars video game has been referenced in this season of The Mandalorian. And uh, that thrills me to no end. Also, if you are a comic book reader, Operation Cinder was mentioned in in a, um, I believe it was a, a mini series. It was called uh, Shattered Empire. And it was mentioned, I think, in the second or third issue. And that was a comic book written by one of my favorite writers, uh, Mr. Mr. Greg Rucka. So... Uh, if you want to read a little bit and get us some reference points, uh, I don't think they go into great detail in my recollection of, the, of that comic book. Uh, but again, Cinder is referenced. And you can do a whole deep dive on Operation Cinder as well. There's a lot of uh, fan belief that Operation Cinder was actually inspired by an old Marvel comic from the, uh, from the early 80s where an uh, Imperial Admiral, I think it was an Admiral, had this whole plan for satellites to wreak havoc uh, on, on, pl on planets. Uh, they, were, they were designed to control weather but he saw the military applications 
and use them to level cities and, and destroy planets. And that's basically what Operation Cinder is. Like they're going to level these Imperial core planets, core worlds, so that the New Republic has nothing, no, uh, there, there'd be no stability in the New Republic. The Emperor's going to take it all down with him. So it, again, an interesting, fascinating reference. And again, it leads to a really great shootout in the Imperial mess. And Mayfeld and Din have to make their escape from the base. And this is where we get some great stuff with Cara Dune and Fennec Shand up on the, up on the hillside, just picking off stormtroopers left and right with sniper rifles. Just some great sniper play. Boba Fett's in Slave 1. He's flying to the rescue them. It's really great. Uh, again, another action set piece that's so good. And Rick does a killer job directing the holy heck out of this. Um, I don't have much more to say about it because, again, it's an action set piece. I don't want to go through it beat by beat with y'all. You've seen the episode. You know how good it is. But I did love Fennec and Kara just picking off Stormtroopers left and right, enabling uh, Din and, and Mayfeld to make it to the rooftop and, and then to make that, that big jump onto Slave 1 and take off. And that's when that's when Mayfeld asks uh, Din to hand him the the, the cycler rifle, the, the rifle that we saw Boba Fett using in the previous episode, and uh, Mayfeld, as as we as he has shown in this episode and in his previous appearance in, in episode six, quite a good shot, and he makes a, a really nice one here uh, as he blows up the Rhydonium facility, and and blows the, the Imperial straight to hell, and that uh. That seems to sway Cara Dune in its thinking that he is still an Imperial at his core, no matter what, what he has been accused of as a criminal. Uh, and so that enables them to make the decision. Well, no, no, hold on. Let's, 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 they're not gone yet. They blow up the facility, but two TIE fighters have taken off in pursuit of Slave 1. And I was like, I was really excited for, for a second. I was like, oh man, we're going to get a sweet dogfight with Slave 1 and a couple of TIE fighters. This is going to be super badass. But Boba Fett, being the, the, the prepared man that he is, the, the, make, uses a move that we've not seen since Episode 2 A Phantom Menace. No, Jesus, Tom. Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, when, when Jango, in attempting to shake Obi-Wan Kenobi from, from pursuit of him over, over Geonosis, deploys the seismic charge which is a weapon that uh, that uses sound and amplifies sound in, a, in a, an explosive blast. And he drops one of these right between the two TIE fighters and blows them, again, straight to hell. So, hey, you got, a, you got an episode two reference in this episode. Not not too bad. I'm sorry, in this chapter. It's, I have, a, listen, let's get into a little bit of, of, let's be honest, I have to be honest with y'all. You are our wonderful listeners. I'm I'm so uh, fortunate and and thankful that you all listen to this show. I I for I get so mixed up because I want to say that every chapter of the Mandalorian is an episode because I'm just trained by Star Wars to think everything is an episode now episode one episode two episode three episode four and so on. So going back and saying for the Mandalorian chapter fourteen chapter fifteen. It, it, it messes with my mind in a way. And you think I would know better, but maybe it's just I have an old man brain. And I, you, this, this old man takes a little bit longer to learn uh, those new tricks. So, uh, uh, some again, really, really great stuff here. Our heroes land. The Empire is no longer in pursuit. And it's, it's uh, again, uh, Kara, fairly impressed by the actions of of Mayfeld and Din agrees uh, they're going to let him go they're going to they're going to report back to the New Republic that Miggs Mayfeld was killed in the refinery explosion on Morak and so now Miggs can go about his business and now again this is where I start to I openly speculate they just leave Miggs on on Morak I'm assuming you know I'm assuming that there's probably a spaceport or two around somewhere so maybe he can get he can get passage off world somehow, but you know there's a bit of a catharsis here when he kills Valen Hess, when he talks about Operation Cinder. Again, we, we see that this character has a, there's a lot more to him than we were we were shown in his first appearance in Chapter Six. Uh, so part of me wonders if 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 he goes back and he tries to 
uh, help the people of Morak get rid of the Empire. He, it, again, he, whatever he can, it, he says it in the episode, you know, whatever he can do to help to sleep at night with a clear conscience. And maybe that involves helping these people of Morak get rid of the Empire. Maybe instead of uh, uh, being a, a, a petty criminal and, and, and gun for hire, uh, maybe it's time to kind of you know, not going to join the new republic. He's not going to join the new republic. He obviously has, you know, our prejudice against them as well, because whatever government body. I mean, it, we played the scene. He's not for governing bodies. Freedom does not mean governing. Freedom is freedom, and that that's his point of view on it. So maybe he's going to try and help these people just liberate themselves from the empire, and maybe he'll deal with the new republic when he when he has to. But I, you know, I don't know. Again, do we go back in in season three and we find out that he has. Uh, teamed up with these side dupes and they were what we thought they were freedom fighters and again that make that that makes us feel a little, a little bad about about watching din uh throwing them off that transport and running them over with giant uh tank treads and wheels and wheels and not tank treads just giant wheels and blowing them up with thermal detonators and you know so again maybe mix feels a debt to them for that it's a it's a possibility we don't know i mean Ben Bird, uh, Bill Bird did not even admit to being in the season of The Mandalorian. Now, it's possible he just signed an NDA and he couldn't talk about it. But when he was asked about it, he said, no, I'm not going to be in season two. Uh, so I, I would not count on him to to uh, be forthcoming if someone asks if he'll be back for season three. But it, it is also fair at this point to say that Din Djarin has uh, amassed quite a collection of friends and allies across this sector of the Star Wars galaxy. So maybe Mayfield's a character we do see down the road, and maybe he's, he is a bit of a freedom fighter moving forward. If I'm right about that, maybe they are just pirates, but they're not very good ones, and they like to blow shit up instead of taking Rhydonium and selling it on the black market. I could be completely wrong. <laughs> but let me know what you all think. So Miggs goes on his way. Din and Kara and Fennec and Boba Fett take off in Slave 1, and Kara asks, asks Din... What's what's the next part of the plan? And, and and it's at that point that we get to we get to catch up with uh, with the moth, our main moth. And let's just go ahead and we're gonna play that scene that closes out the episode because hey, that's what we do here. You ready? Here we go. Moth Gideon, you have something I want. You may think you have some idea what you are in possession of. But you do not. Soon, he will be back with me. He means more to me than you will ever know. Bam. There it is. Declaration of intent from Din Djarin to Moff Gideon. And it's pretty darn impressive stuff. I loved it. I loved them taking the words that Moff Gideon yells says to them in chapter 7 of season 1 when they're when they're in the standoff at the bar how it closes out the episode and it seems like our heroes are just trapped in peril and and ooh i i i i love that sort of connectivity between connectivity symmetry whatever you want to say about it i love din spitting his words back at him Loved it. It got me, gave me the goosebumpies all over the body, all over the body. Now I is is funny because because I didn't. It's probably the one thing I didn't expect actually for the end of this episode. I don't I don't think I had predicted that that Din would sort of make this declaration of intent that he would announce Tomoff Gideon that he was coming after him. Um, I thought we might get more of a scene of Din and Kara rounding up help. You know, recruiting. Bo Katan and and her Mandos, uh, m- maybe even wrangling up uh, uh, Cobb Vanth, uh, you know, to to assist. I, I I wasn't sure what to expect. I thought I thought we might get more of like that sort of montagey scene where we're getting all the heroes together. But I think this works so much so much better than that. I think I think what I was expecting again, like him approaching Bo Katan or sending a hollow communique to Bo Katan and asking for help, was a tad predictable. I like this idea that Din is is willing to announce his intentions, to put it out there, to put Moff Gideon on the defensive. Maybe a little bit. Now, Moff Gideon could be a typical Imperial 
full of arrogance and 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 uh, just insurmountable belief in himself and that he is uh, unstoppable. But I love that that Din made that. I did. I in in retrospect, I love that Din made that that proclamation to to Gideon. And you know, maybe we will open up next episode, the final episode of season two, the final chapter of season two, with that scene where he's rounding up all the allies he's made over the past two seasons, if any of them are left alive. Now, the interesting, the interesting thing to consider here is, you know, last season. We, we did lose a character. We You know, IG-11 sacrificed himself to save the group. Will we get a similar sort of situation where uh, someone has to die? And uh, listen, I'm not, I'm, I, I don't want to say I'm calling my shot because I, I, don't, I don't know if that's... I don't want to play that game necessarily. But I do think someone will, will not make it out of this. You're going to... Especially if they're on, on an Imperial Star Cruiser someone's not going to make it off that ship alive. And I think there's, I think there is a reasonable basis to believe that it will be Cara Dune who makes a sacrifice to save our, 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 our heroes to uh, help Din reunite with Grogu and escape the empire. Once again, I could be dead wrong about that. I could be completely wrong about that. But I don't know yet. There's there's a lot of, I mean, this there's a lot of ground here for for, I mean, anything could happen. That's the wonderful charm about this show. I mean, it, there's so many different directions for it to go in. You know, it, it could be completely possible that that Moff ca- that Moff Gideon captures all of them, and that's how the season ends. And he starts forcing them to do his bidding, to be agents of of the Empire. And in next season, we see. Uh, Din and and Boba and Fennec and, and maybe even Cara Dune if if she survives, uh, doing things against the New Republic and becoming public enemy number one against the New Republic. We are in a in a, in a scenario with endless possibilities, endless potential, and and uh, you know I think as much as we want to see that reunion between Grogu and Mando, uh, if if he finds himself in a in a situation that that would help Grogu, you know, if it were to save Grogu's life, I think Din would easily agree to a, to a situation where, where he would go into into Gideon's employ if it meant keeping Grogu alive and, and being able to potentially be with Grogu at, uh, on, on, at some, to some extent. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's going to be a long week waiting for that episode to drop. I can't, I can't tell you how excited I am for it and how much I uh, am ready for it it's going to be a really really great time and uh yes once again i will be up at three in the morning i may even get up a little bit earlier because i suspect this one will this episode will probably push an hour uh pretty easily and since i have to get to work right after the episode's done i may (laughs) i may get up a tad early just to make sure i have enough time to get it all all watched with that being said uh this has been mandovision our review, our breakdown, our analysis, a little speculation. For Chapter 15, The Believer, written and directed by Rick Famuiwa. Ooh, I hope I got it that time. And and uh, I, again, I think this is a pretty darn stellar episode. A, a lot of meat on the bone here. A lot of great action pieces, which uh, uh, Rick did a bang-up job doing that in Season 1, so why not do it in Season 2? Especially since this was his only episode for Season 2. You know, you might as well get go for the gusto on this one, right? Uh, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, and, and I, I think it sets the stage wonderfully for what I think will be a uh, action-packed and a potentially an emotional episode, a closing episode for Season 2. Again, uh, we're, we will be going into Chapter 16, the Season 2 finale. It's going to be a big deal. It's going to be a big deal. And again, don't be too surprised if Cara Dune is the character who uh, doesn't make it out. I, and I say that based only on the fact that, like, I don't know if I don't know how Disney feels about her tweeting. And I'm, by tweeting, I mean I mean Gina Carano's uh, tweeting her, her sort of uh, poking the bear sort of tweets. I don't know their take on it, but I know it's riled up a a large segment of the fan base. So uh, I don't know their perception of that though. But she doesn't seem to have any interest in uh, toning it down or stopping. And if that's something that bothers Disney. There might be an easy fix to that, and maybe they knew it was coming, so that's why they haven't really commented on it. And maybe that's why at yesterday's uh, Shareholders Day, 
uh, that we only were told about a female centric show. Now maybe they're keeping the mystery alive. They want to suspect, you know, wonder what characters are going to make it out of this season alive, or maybe it's because they had to change their plans and uh, Gina Carano wasn't going to be the fit they wanted her to be because uh, she can be a bit uh, incendiary on social media, and if if she has no interest in in curbing that, um, which is her prerogative, then then maybe they they decide to go another direction. I don't know. I, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see. I'm again. I am just crazy excited. I can't wait to watch it. I hope you all feel the same way. Let me know how you all felt with this episode. Am I am I crazy? Am I am I uh, uh, too high on this one? Do you guys think I'm overreacting? I'm reading too much into it. Do you think I'm I'm wrong about the freedom fighter aspect? Is, or were they just pirates? Were they just crazy pirates who wanted to to blow stuff up? Uh, you know, like like Alfred said, they, they just they just want to watch the world burn. That was a terrible Alfred. I'm sorry about that. I'll never do that again. Uh, let me know. Remember, re- the best way to reach out to this podcast is via social media. We are at Mando underscore Vision on Twitter and Instagram. Make sure you are liking, subscribing, and sharing the show with all the other Mandos in your life. Uh, we are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play, and several others. And let me know if there's one more you need us on. And if you're on Apple Podcast, please write those five-star reviews. They mean the world to us. All right, let's wrap it up. Let's get out of here. Let's go watch Chapter 15, The Believer, all over again because it's it's that darn good. All right, thank you all so much for listening. I will be back, well, definitely next Friday, but maybe there'll be another Bantha Tracks in between. We'll see, we'll see what else pops up on the Star Wars radar in the meantime. But remember, until the next time we talk, this is the way. This is the way. This is the way. This is the way.